The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the guests and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of the hosts and creators of this program. This is the Pet Buzz. This is the Pet Buzz. Freshly collected with news, celebrity pet gossip, and the latest pet trends. The Pet Buzz gives you the latest 411 on everything pet related. Everything pet related. Hosted by pet trendologist Charlotte Reed and Dr. Michael Fleck. And here's the Dynamic, Dynamic pet, pet Duo. You are listening to the Pet Buzz, the ultimate in pet talk radio. We welcome our listeners who tune in each week from around the world. You know, this week on the show, we're talking about CBD and pet health. Cornell Veterinary School of Medicine and Chief Medical Officer Joseph Waxschlag is joining us to discuss his recent evidence-based study regarding CBD and canine mobility. That's later on in the show, so you're going to have to stick around for that. Yeah, that's a hot topic. And do all dogs swim? I don't know. Veterinarian Dr. Deborah Mandel is joining us from the American Red Cross to discuss animals and water safety. Mm -hmm. If you have a dog who likes the pool, the lake, the beach, or even a boat ride, you'll learn how to protect his life and his health. And, of course, we feature the I Likey of the Week right here That's all in segment three. And in segment two, we have the latest scoop on your favorite celebrities and their pets. Oh, yeah, we can't forget our favorite portion of the show, and that's Flex Facts. That's in here, too. Dr. Fleck is talking about what happens when a dog bites another dog. Do you know what to do? Well, he does, and he's going to tell us how to handle that situation. And let's start our show talking about New York State. New York, my hometown. Your home state. My home state. Okay, so if you don't know, New York State became the first state in the nation to ban cat declawing, a practice that animal advocates consider cruel and unnecessary. Governor Andrew Cuomo signed the bill into law on Monday, July 22nd, after the state legislatures passed the ban in June. Well, Assemblywoman Rosenthal, Mazel Tov, congratulations. And I know that you've had other animal bills signed into law, but how does this victory make you feel? Well, this victory makes me feel overjoyed because it's been such a long time coming Mm -hmm. and it it will have such an immediate impact on so many cats who were scheduled to be declawed. Uh, The law went into effect right away. Wow. uh, which Which means that, you know, we've saved so many cats from having this mutilating operation that, you know, was designed to protect people's furniture rather than... Uh, make sure the cats are intact and uh, have their claws, which they need, obviously, for, for, for living. many reasons. I think so. I definitely think so. So when and what prompted you to introduce the bill into the New York State Legislature? I mean, are, are you a cat lover? And, you know, when you talk about when, like, how, I mean, it seems like, what's the process so people understand how long this took you? Okay, well, uh, rewinding back to 13 years ago when I was first elected, uh, one of my first bills to become law was one that provides for animals to get orders of protection uh, when they're in situations where their their person is in an abusive relationship. So that was my first, first one, and I've been on a tear ever since. So I've passed many, maybe 20-plus laws concerning animals. But this one in particular, I met the people who started the PAW Project, and I was introduced to them by a woman named Jane Hoffman, and we went out to the diner I know near Jane my very apartment. well. Oh, I know yeah. J- well, years ago, I apprenticed with her. I apprenticed with her at the ASPCA in the dog training program oh. years ago. Oh, wow, yeah. Animal people don't go away. They just... They don't, even <laughs> if they know, move they away. pursuing it. Even if they move away like me from New York to Florida, yeah, we never go away. No, absolutely. Until the job is done, and uh, it's going to take a long time. So that's why this is like such a key victory, because Mm -hmm. it's something that never happened before. But Jane introduced me to the PAW Project. They presented the issue to me as an animal person, a person who cares and has done lots of legislation for animals, but also I have cats. So they knew that I would understand both from a like a legislative point of view, but mm-hmm. also from a personal one. And so I agreed to take this on. I love challenges, and uh, this was a great challenge and so important. So five years ago after our meeting, I introduced the bill into the legislature. What happens after that is it gets assigned to a committee. 
and it has to uh, be voted out of the committee, and that's how it starts its journey to becoming a law. So this one I introduced five years ago. It went to the Agriculture Committee, and the chair of the Agriculture Committee and people on the committee were against. And so I didn't have the votes necessary to have it voted out of committee. And part of the reason is because the Veterinarian Society in the state opposed it. So that was a giant hurdle that we had to overcome. So over the five years, we, you know, we disproved every claim they made about why this was a necessary surgery mm-hmm. and why it had to be an option for people. And after all this time and, and getting a new chair of the Agriculture Committee, Donna Lopardo, and educating the people on the committee that uh, this is cruelty. This is, this is not allowed. It should right. not be allowed. What and a so, long road you had to hoe to get this approved. I mean, people just don't really understand. I mean, they, you know, they, they, they just, ha- they have no idea how long and all the obstacles that it, it took for this. And the fact that the uh, official state veterinary association opposed it really made people think, well, the vets are the ones who know the most about animals and right. they think it's, it's a fine thing. So we had to disprove it. And that's where a lot of the allies and advocates came in who are recognized experts on animals, like obviously the Paw Project, HSUS, the City of the Kitty, Alley Cats, Humane Veterinarians, Ethical Veterinarian Organization, and many others who, who came forward and said, listen, this is not okay, it is cruel, it is barbaric, and it's unnecessary because the problem that people were contending with was, you know, scratching their expensive furniture. There are ways to redirect the cat's uh, behavior. Sure, and And that might take um, a little bit of money and a little bit of time. I mean, I've had show cats, and I live in Florida now, and, um, you know, a lot of older people who are on blood thinners in some cases would like to have their cats declawed. It's something that it's hard for me to wrap my hand around that or wrap my head around that. I just I just don't believe it. I have a cat. I have dogs. I mean, I, I, I've i shown cats. I've had cats. Most people think of me as a dog person. But I just I think it's horrible. I think it's absolutely it par- positively horrible. But, you know, let's talk a little bit about the a quick overview of the law. I mean, we know it it, it bans uh, cat decline. So talk a little bit about it and the penalties that are associated with it. And are there any exceptions? It went into effect immediately, Mm -hmm. and what it bars is any surgery, any declawing of a cat, unless it's for a medical reason, for example, a tumor, um, an infection that doesn't go away. Sure. Um, A clear medical reason, not human medical reasons and not furniture reasons. Okay. And, And so it's, you know, there are exceptions, of course, when necessary, but if... A veterinarian does declaw without those um, exceptions. They're subject to a $1,000 fine, you know, right off the bat. Okay. So now we know it's animal health exceptions only. It has nothing to do with humans, and a veterinarian will be fined. Okay. So if you just joined us, we're talking with Assemblywoman Linda Rosenthal about her victory, her declawing a bill that was signed into law on Monday, July 22nd by the governor of New York State. Although you're a politician and assembly person, you know, I, 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 when I think of you, I think of you as an animal lover and an animal advocate. So I, thank you so much for all the good work that thank you, you do. Thank uh, you. And like I, I said... I'll tell, my, I'll tell my kid if you said that. <laughs> okay, good. Well, to learn more about Assemblywoman Linda Rosenthal, visit nyassembly.gov slash mem slash linda hyphen b hyphen R. Rosenthal, and we're going to put that up on our website and our social media channel. So if you want to learn more, you can look her up, uh, write her office, and I'm going to suggest send her a donation for all her good work, wherever you are, even if it's $5, because every little bit helps, and you're helping her do more great animal work. We're going to take a commercial break, come back in a flash later in the show. We're going to find out what one Arizona man is doing to catch a doggy doo-doo bandit. And up next, find out which of our favorite movie actresses who's appearing in a popular HBO hit got her first dog. And then I'm going to ask Dr. Fleck, what are you going to do when your dog gets bitten by another dog?
My name is Michelle Schaefer. I'm the mom of three boys, and I'm from Haddonfield and North Wildwood, New Jersey. I met Aladdin through my work with Lilo's Promise Animal Rescue, and I foster the emaciated dogs that come into our program. Aladdin came to us. He had been dumped at the side of the road. He weighed about 18 pounds. He had broken bones, other wounds, and he was missing 12 teeth. He was the worst abuse case I had ever seen. The most moving experience that I've had while working with Aladdin were when we were first responders at the Pulse nightclub shooting in Orlando, Florida. And Aladdin usually works off leash. He was on leash that night and he led me over to a very specific person. And here that man had been in the nightclub the night of the shootings. He and Aladdin shared a very special moment that really made me cry. Aladdin has changed the way I see the world in a million different ways. The main thing is to treat people with kindness and compassion. My name is Michelle Schaefer, and Aladdin and I are individuals. Warmer temperatures mean more time outside. You have sunscreen for yourself, but what about Fido? According to the American Animal Hospital Association and the American College of Veterinary Dermatology, pets need sunscreen too. I love two things, sports and my dog Chester. Where I go, he goes. To the beach, to play soccer, everywhere. We spend a lot of time together in the sun, so I always carry a can of EpiPet sunscreen. So Chester is protected from the sun's harmful UV rays. I just spray it on and I don't have to worry. Chester is protected, so I know my sports buddy is going to be with me for a long time. Thanks, EpiPet. Use EpiPet Sun Protector, the only FDA-approved pet sunscreen on short-haired, light-colored, hairless, golden retrievers, and other dogs susceptible to skin cancer. Contained in a sports bottle, EpiPet allows you to turn the bottle upside down, making it easier to spray your dog all over to protect your dog from the sun all day and every day. Visit epi-pet.com. Thank you for joining us on the Pet Buzz. This show is hosted by the dynamic pet duo on Pet Trendologist, Charlotte Reed. And I'm veterinarian, Dr. Michael Fleck. We have the latest scoop on your favorite celebrities and their pets. Oh, yeah. Well, on a happy note, Nicole Kidman revealed that she had a new addition to her family. The Big Little Lies actress opened up about getting her first dog at 52 in an Instagram post a few weeks ago. She shared an adorable pic of her smiling at the pooch, which is an apricot toy poodle, as she held it up close to her face. Unfortunately, she didn't disclose her furry friend's name. Well, on a sad note, Joe Jonas and Sophie Turner are mourning the loss of their beloved pet. TMZ reports that last week the newlyweds suffered a tragedy when their dog, Waldo Picasso, was struck and killed by a car in New York City. According to TMZ, at the time of the incident, the Alaskan clique was being walked on the Lower East Side of Manhattan by Jonas's and Turner's dog walker. Though Waldo was on a leash, the pup reportedly wrangled free after becoming spooked by a pedestrian and ran off into the street. An oncoming car then tragically hit the dog in what Jonas reps called a freak accident. So are you ready for another Flex Facts? Welcome to Just the Facts. Just the Facts. Fact or fiction? Just the Facts, ma'am. You want answers! I want the truth! It's going to take long. You got the time. What are we going to talk about today, Doc? Well, let's talk about dog bites. Dogs? Biting dogs. Ah, great topic because animals can be such unpredictable creatures. You know, at times dog owners may find themselves in a scary situation of having their dog bitten by another dog. You know, I've been there. I've learned that when your pooch sustains a dog bite, there's no one size fits all solution. I know that in a dangerous situation, like for example, if you're in the dog park, you really got to keep a cool head because knowing What you're looking for when assessing the injury and having an idea of what to do next can really ensure that your wounded dog receives proper care and makes a speedy recovery. So, Dr. Fleck, Mm -hmm. if your dog gets bitten, what's the first thing you need to do? Well, obviously, it depends on where you're at. But if you're at the dog park, for example, get him home immediately. Okay. But be careful. Okay. Because he may be in pain and we don't want him biting you unnecessarily when he doesn't want to do that. I never thought about that. But it's kind of important to get as much information as you can 
from the owner of the other dog that he got in a fight with, okay. if at all possible. Okay. Sometimes they're tight-lipped, you know. Okay, of course. But get as much information as you can because that information will be helpful after the treatment of your dog at the veterinarian, which you're going to be going to, of course. Okay, but what kind of information? Am I, like their name and address? What, yeah, what do I need to know? You, you need to know their name, their address, and if at all possible, some kind of medical history about the, the other dog. Like if they're vaccinated? Like if they're vaccinated. Okay. Yes. Now, what if the incident happens on someone else's property, like you're walking by and the dog comes out and charges you? Uh, well, I've always told everybody when they're walking their dog, they need to have some sort of a protective weapon, so to speak, uh, available. Okay. Now like that, mace or something. Mace. Like pe- pepper. It's actually mace could be illegal, but so pepper spray. Okay. So now you were talking about, I got to go to the vet because you said that was like the most important thing, right? So I guess like what happens at like, do you ever do you ever find people like who don't take the dog to the vet or like you said you have to do it? Talk about the assessment and uh, the wound or something like that. You you ask if people don't take it to the vet? Yes, not initially sometimes, but then I see them a few days later when the infection actually oh. shows up, okay. which they could have taken care of at the time. So if they're in any kind of a dog fight that that really shows some sort of effort of of wounding the mm-hmm. individual. You're, you're best off to schedule an appointment with the veterinarian. Get them in right away. So even though small puncture uh, bites could really cause infection. Yeah, well, think about this. You know, think about a syringe and a needle. The mouth of the dog would be like the syringe, and the teeth would be like the needle, and the dog bites, and so is the, you're actually injecting whatever's in that mouth, which is full of bacteria. Okay, so, the, so there could be a lot of bacteria on the teeth that could, like, kind of get under the skin and could get an abscess and like and that, and that aggravates the type of wound that the that the dog makes with with the biting with the trauma now what about tissue and nerve damage is that something i need to be wary of it is definitely something to be wary of and you look as much for much normality as you can is the dog limping is the dog having difficult time breathing where was the wound inflicted oh. So that's really important, the location of the wound. Okay. So are there, like you said, are there, like if the dog gets bitten on the nose, because that happens a lot. They sniff each other, the dog snaps. Mm -hmm. Like, should I worry about the nose and the mouth area as much as like the torso? Well, it depends on how deep the wound is that the Uh individual attacks and how many times it may bite the mouth. Okay. So again, uh, the best effort is to always take the pet to a veterinarian have the veterinarian assess it, and do the appropriate treatment that needs to be done for that type of a wound. Well, you know, I I was always under the impression that the nose area and maybe the mouth heal a little quicker, but like bites on the legs, torso, or the neck can become a lot more serious. I mean, I know with my dog who died, who was bitten on the neck. I mean, she didn't make it, but... Well, you know, they. uh, I think it's pretty well understood that Dogs, if they really want to go for the kill, they're going to go for the neck. Okay. And so that's like something else people, I think, need to realize. Okay. So at the vet, like, what do they do? How do they, like, deal with the wound? Well, again, everything is on an individual basis, but if the wounds don't seem to be too serious, first of all, you want to assess pain because that helps you tell how badly that wound is. Uh-huh. Um, the visual. I mean, all of us can look at it visually and see if there's open wounds, whether there's big tears that may need additional type or more intensive sort of Don't you guys, cl- you guys clean it. How is it cleaned? Well, it's cleaned with, with some sort of a cleansing aid. It might be saline solution. Uh-huh. Um, I like to use peroxide. A lot of the doctors in wound care don't like to use peroxide as much, but you need to use some sort of a cleansing agent. And then that gives you a better idea to see how serious the wound is also because you sometimes can't see just from visualization without cleaning it. Okay, so do you clip the hair? I know and sometimes you do. Generally speaking, the hair will be clipped. You'll be making an assessment. Are we going to be clipping hair to just send this pet home, or are we going to keep it and observe, or are we going to have to consider doing surgical procedure? Okay. That's the assessment. Okay, so basically you're going to like clean, you clip the hair around the wound, maybe put a bacterial or cleaning solution in there, maybe lavage the wound out with some saline. Absolutely. And then you, uh, and you'll and you probably start some antibiotics to make sure there's no infection, right? Well, you'll clearly they, they're going to need injections of medication, and, okay. and they'll all have to have medications that go home with them. Antibiotic is probably... 
the number one ingredient that they'll need. Okay. Depending upon how how painful it is, will also determine what kind of pain meds okay. may have to go. So there's a with possibility your dog could, that could, sounds like it could be, get expensive just on this local small bite level. But what if it's like more serious? If it's a puncture wound or something on the torso? Yeah, I don't think that we have to look at it being so terribly expensive. If it's a if it's an outpatient sort of a thing, doing just what we just described, and don't forget post traumatic shock. That sometimes is is really something that mm. may show not I never thought about show it that up for, way. for maybe four hours later, six hours later. So that's another reason why it's important to see the veterinarian so that they can administer medication to prevent that. And you know what? That's all the flex facts for today. Well, stay tuned. We're going to talk about my I likey of the week and animal water safety. It's all coming up right after this commercial break. You are listening to The Pet Buzz with pet trendologist Charlotte Reed and veterinarian Dr. Michael Fleck. We would love to communicate with you via social media. Use the Pet Buzz social media channels on Twitter and Facebook to make a comment or ask a question. Post a picture of your pet on Instagram and tell us about his or her unique personality. You can also write to us at team at thepetbuzz.com. For more information about our show, our guests, and buzzworthy freebies, visit us at thepetbuzz.com. Warmer temperatures mean more time outside. You have sunscreen for yourself, but what about Fido? According to the American Animal Hospital Association and the American College of Veterinary Dermatology, pets need sunscreen too. Use EpiPet Sun Protector, the only FDA-approved pet sunscreen on short-haired, light-colored, hairless, golden retrievers, and other dogs susceptible to skin cancer. Contained in a sports bottle, EpiPet allows you to turn the bottle upside down, making it easier to spray your dog all over to protect your dog from the sun all day and every day. Visit epi-pet.com. Welcome back. You're listening to the Pet Buzz, the best in pet talk radio. I'm pet trendologist Charlotte Reed. And I'm veterinarian Dr. Michael Fleck. So I got an I likey for you. That's the way it has to be because that's the way I like it. It's genius. I like it. I love it so much. I like it. It's to die for. I like it. So when I was in Las Vegas about two weeks ago, now here's the sidebar. I was there because I was doing a pet cool segment on the CBS affiliate KLAS. Well, the day I arrived, the temperature soared up to 109 degrees. I think it was the hottest day of the year in Vegas. Well, I'm going back to Vegas in about three weeks, and it's still going to be really hot. So I need to be prepared for Ty. You know, Ty is my English toy spaniel whose tongue sticks out. So for the trip, and I really need to keep them cool. I'm going to bring some cooler dog products with me. Cooler dog brand creates cooling products that help dogs stay safer and more comfortable in the heat. And the best part, they're pretty affordable. Prices range from about $24 to $179. So let me tell you what they have. So in addition to hydration uh, products, that's like water bowls. The two best methods to protect a dog from the heat are physical cooling and then shade. So the product lines include cooling vests, cooling collars, and cooling mats, as well as a pop-up shade oasis. The pop-up shade oasis is not a containment center or crate, but it's kind of like a a little sunshade. So it's got upper gray fabric that blocks about 98% of the UV rays. The mats are great because they're chew resistant, and uh, they actually offer 10 more times cooling power than gel pads. You can snap them together like two, three, or four for larger dogs. And inside, there's like multi-layers to keep the uh, ice sheets cool. Now, the ice sheets are made with purified water. And you also use the ice sheets and their smaller versions for the cooling vest and the collars. And they come in four sizes, extra small, small, medium, and large. Um, but this is what I found really interesting. The cooling part goes under the belly and the chest. So think about it. When you see a dog sprawled out trying to get cool, he lies down on his belly. So you can also prepare ahead since um, the ice sheets last about 30 minutes for the cooling vest and, and whatnot. You can actually get an extra set of ice sheets and then freeze them and then put them in the cooler dog flexi-freeze cooler storage packet so basically the bottom line is you want cooling products you got to check out cooler it's definitely one of my summertime faves well the summertime is a great time to enjoy the water with your dog but it can be a dangerous place if you're totally unprepared joining us today is dr deborah mandel dr mandel is the pet safety advisor for the american red cross 
and a member of its Scientific Advisory Council. Dr. Mandel, thanks for rejoining us. Yeah, we had her when we, we yes. had, do you remember we had her when we talked about the Red Cross Pet Safety and Health app? I do remember. Okay. Anyway, thank thanks you for, for rejoining me. us. <laughs> okay, so my first question, are all dogs natural swimmers, and what's the best way to introduce them to the water? Well, you know, you would think that all dogs know how to swim or do the doggy paddle because it's named after them, but that instinct may actually not kick in, and they really might not like the water. Some breeds, like breeds with pushed-in noses like bulldogs, can have real issues with swimming and may not be really good swimmers. So, no, not all, not all dogs are natural swimmers. The best way to introduce a dog is to just do it slowly and gently. Carry them or help them into the pool, holding them up, kind of see how they react. If there are stairs, kind of let them go on the stairs and, again, kind of see how they react. If they become frantic, if they can't support their weight and they're thrashing around, take them out. Give them time. You know, try again another day. Definitely never force a dog to go in the water. Some dogs might be fine just going on the stairs. But if you put them in the water and you're holding them up, you want to make sure their front legs and their hind legs are both paddling. They can support their weight and just very slowly introduce them to see how they do. You know, it's so funny as you're talking about this, and I don't know if you're thinking about this too, as she's talking about the bulldogs and the various dogs in the water, I can't help but thinking of the SoCal surf dog crew, all those dogs who surf in Southern California. And, you know, some of the great surf dogs have been, uh, have been bulldogs, which is so I funny think- because with their weight, they always have a tendency to go plots right down to the bottom of the pool. And their, their respiratory system is not necessarily meant for swimming. So, yeah, those, those are just the ones, if, if they're not trained in surfing, definitely be careful around the water. <laughs> well, it does sound like a lot of similarities the way you, you would introduce an infant to water. Absolutely. So why is it important to invest in water safety products? No matter how much your dog loves to swim, they should never be allowed near in the water unsupervised. And you, you're going to take the same precautions, like you said, for children – you take those same precautions for your pets. And so it's really important to have barriers around the pool so that they can't try to take laps while not being watched. And these barriers will also keep other animals, like you said, wildlife or other animals that wander into the yard, they'll keep those animals from taking a midnight swim without you knowing. So those are very important. Pool alarms are also great because they'll tell you if someone is getting in the pool or is in the pool unknowingly. So barriers, alarms, life jackets are good as long as they don't give sort of a false sense of security. They're never used instead of supervision. And there are ramps and other things that, again, just an added measure of safety for the dogs if the dogs that go in the water. I think that's great advice because, you know, um, uh, Dwayne Johnson, you know, Fast and Furious, they have a new movie coming out. I mean, he's not per se in the movie, but he had two young French bulldogs and he let them out by the pool and they drowned. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And they were not even like six months old. And then I think Pink, her dog, she had an English bulldog. I think her English bulldog drowned in the pool. Th- yeah, it's, you know, it's, it happens. Well, I, I think the elderly dogs, too. Great point. Got dementia or so, and before they can have orientation and, and great knowledge of movement, but sometimes they lose that. And matter of fact, I happen to be a victim of that. I lost a pup one time because of, of that. It was an elderly dog, about 15, 16. Dog. Or if they have respiratory conditions or bad arthritis where they just can't move around as well. Absolutely. Well, okay, well, if you've just joined us, we're talking with the American Red Cross's Dr. Deborah Mandel about water safety in pets. So I guess to to your our last uh, few points, this is why it's important, I guess, to train a dog to exit the pool? Absolutely, because that fall into the pool or going into the pool without you knowing as much as you do everything to make sure that doesn't happen, if it does happen, you have to make sure that your dog knows how to get out easily because they can become frantic and fatigue and drown if they don't know how to get out. And so training them where the stairs are many times, making the stairs easily visible, getting a ramp, there, there are pet ramps that it's easier for, you know, for dogs to get out of pools, having multiple exits, extremely, extremely important. Well, you know, it's even important down here in Florida because in Philadelphia where you are, you have snow and all that horrible stuff (laughs) but down here uh, in florida 
that's the outlet for people just letting their pets to go out to void. And it's by the pool many times. So they really need to be cognizant of that in Florida about the awareness of where their pet is, the general health, and the mentality of it. Yeah, and I was going to say, coupled with that, you know, if you have young children, make sure that they close the doors so pets uh, can't get out into those, sometimes those closed lanai, sometimes those outdoor uh, pool areas. But also the other thing is we always have alligators in the pool because there have been some stories in the last uh, few months of alligators. They do in Chicago. Come on, I know, I was just about, about to say that yeah. they talked about Chance the alligator, and they had to bring in someone from Florida, an alligator man from Florida. Boats. Let's talk about boats a little bit. We always hear or read about dogs falling out of boats. Yeah. How do we prevent yeah. that? Well, obviously, the safest thing is to not bring your dog on the boat. But if you are going to or need to, actually having a barrier around the outside of the boat, having rope barriers or, you know, made, made fences similar to fences around the boat so they can't jump or fall off. Again, making sure your dog knows how to swim. Life jackets can be helpful and, and they have handles. But make sure that life jacket can support the weight of your dog if you do have to grab them and lift them up. Keeping them inside in the middle of the boat, especially if the, if the water is getting really rocky where they can easily fall off. So, again, very similar precautions that you would take for a child that was on a boat. Yeah, and I think it's a good time to mention if you are going to invest in a life jacket, you want to do some research, um, you know, look at some reviews of various life. Just don't buy the first life jacket you see because it's a pretty color. But it's a good idea <laughs> if you are going to buy a life jacket to make sure it's in a bright color. And if you are going to play with water toys, especially um, out off of the boat when people are swimming, make sure they're bright so you can always locate your dog. Okay. Well, Dr. Mandel, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Well, that was veterinarian Dr. Deborah Mandel, the pet safety advisor for the American Red Cross. So what's next on the show? When I come back, I'm going to fill you in on my global pet news. So stay tuned. So I just moved in with his family, and it's embarrassing. The little one, he likes to go outside and crawl around in the giant litter box. I don't know what he's doing. I mean, I was born, and I knew how to use the litter box. That's disgusting. I really hope he grows out of this for his sake. A person is the best thing to happen to a shelter pet. Be that person. Adopt. When your doctor recommended omega fatty acids as a daily supplement, he told you that they promoted better heart, brain, skin, joint, and immune system health. Well, doesn't it make sense for your pet to have the same health benefits? EpiPet Whole Fish Treat, an all-natural smoked fish supplement, is 100% bioavailable, bringing your pets the nutrients they need to keep them healthy and happy. To order better pet health for your dog or cat, visit www.epi-pet.com. I'm pet friendologist Charlotte Reed. And I'm veterinarian Dr. Michael Fleck. Here at the Pet Buzz, we are urban. Suburban and, and country. country. So let's kick off this segment with global pet news. And now, Pet Buzz news from around the globe. Well, there's a hunt for, check this out, the doggy doo-doo bandit. (laughs) Yes, the doggy doo-doo bandit. That's right. You heard me right. A Phoenix man has a message for a particular pet owner after they fail to scoop up the poop. The man who wants to remain anonymous, I don't know why, because he was on the news, everyone got to see him, said an unknown dog owner has been letting their dog poop in and around his yard for several weeks. Now, check this, what this anonymous man did. He circled one spot of defecation on the sidewalk with chalk and left a message for the dog owner, hoping it would draw attention to the issue. Can you believe this? He's an interesting He must have a lot of time on his hands. Mm -hmm. I mean, who wants a circle? I mean, circle, he went outside and got some, some, like, pink chalk and circled the poop. He said his attempt at communicating Mm -hmm. with the unknown dog owner did not work. So what he did was he wrote, on the sidewalk in chalk, I'm not mad at your dog. It wants what we all want, to wake up and have a poop. <laughs> I'm mad at you, the dog owner, for not cleaning it up. Good dog, bad owner. <laughs> mm-hmm. The man hopes the dog owner will see the message and be better about picking up after his poop. That's why it's important to keep extra bags, scoop, scoop up, up the, the poop. poop. So let's move on with the show. 
Well, you know, the exploding market for CBD is betting big on pets. Well, according to data from the Brightfield Group, CBD in the U.S. alone is expected to reach about $24 billion by 2023, with pets taking up about 7% of those market sales. Well, joining us today to talk about pet safe use of CBD is veterinarian Dr. Joseph Washlog, a professor of nutrition and sports medicine at Cornell University School of Veterinary Medicine. In addition to his groundbreaking CBD study in 2017, Dr. Washlog and LVET are currently conducting seven CBD trials. How are you today? Not too bad. How are you? Good. So let's talk a little bit about CBD. So tell us what CBD is and what's prompting so many pet owners to try CBD for their pet ailments. CBD is really cannabidiol. It's something that's a derivative of, um, let's say, the cannabinoids in in, uh, marijuana slash hemp plants. And the reality is, is that hemp in general makes CBD, while the marijuana plant makes something called THC, and so CBD doesn't have any psychotropic effects, nor is it uh, toxic that we know of at this point. So I guess one of the big questions, like you said, is so why do owners need to be careful when purchasing CBD? Is it just dosing issues, or, I mean, is all CBD Uh, the same? Currently in the industry is because there are all kinds of uh, different manufacturers, different amounts of cannabinoids in these products. And so if you're staying within the, we'll say, the, the legal realm of, of hemp production, you're hopefully going to have low THC, but there have been a couple of human as well as a recent um, examination of products on the shelf, and a lot of them don't really say what they have, uh, say, say, you know, don't have what they say they have in them, as well as uh, they have other cannabinoids, and some are occasionally you know, close to the limit of what THC can be in a hemp product. So I think that's where... Uh, that's where the regulation has to come in about uh, from an FDA standpoint is, is, you know, what are you producing? Uh, Is it consistent from batch to batch, contaminated with heavy metals? What kind of pesticides uh, are being used? I mean, there are a lot of questions I think need to be answered from, you know, the manufacturer standpoint. And that's where I think the, the average consumer, the average pet owner isn't really aware of all the questions they should be asking on the phone to some of these producers. No, actually, it's really interesting that you mentioned that because in preparation for this interview, I must have looked about at 40 brands of pet CBD, different, you know, (laughs) where it was grown. Some was grown in Kentucky. Some was grown in um, Maryland. Some was, I mean, some was grown in California, Colorado. Um, Some Mm -hmm. for cats, for example, used 100 milligrams. Some used 300. Some used 250. So it was just really... um, it was really confusing. Also, some right. mentioned hemp seed oil. Some mentioned hemp. I mean, there was just mm-hmm. so much. I mean, I started having to take notes and go back and forth because I was just getting so confused. So if I was getting confused, yeah. I can imagine that the average yeah. owner was getting confused. Well, anyway, if you've just joined us, we're talking with Dr. Joseph Washlag, who conducted some of the first clinical trials to test the use of hemp-based products for dogs. Um, there are very few evidence-based studies about CBD. So tell us about yours. <laughs> Uh, and you and your ongoing research. I guess yeah, it's very interesting because this is the, the original research was done a, a couple of years ago before it really became a, we'll just say one of the most popular topics in veterinary medicine today. And so we were kind of doing this under the old 2014 guidelines for hemp production, and we did this very small clinical trial on osteoarthritis. We also did some. Absorption kinetics, just to understand how well dogs absorb this uh, this product. They seem to absorb it quite well. We went on to move and moved on to a clinical trial of arthritis, and, and it's uh, you know about seventy to eighty percent of the dogs having pretty positive clinical responses to it. And then, of course, it was in a placebo-blinded uh, study where they were on one product that was a placebo. They then switched over to the treatment, or vice versa. And uh, there was some pretty profound uh, owner uh, subjective outcome measures that, that seemed to be, um, you know, as good as your typical non-steroidal or maybe even better. Um, and of course, you know, we followed blood work, and some of that blood work did show that there is a mild increase in, in one of the liver enzymes. It's not particularly problematic, but 
does show that there is definitely something going on at the level of the body that's uh, you know altering some of the liver, liver biochemistry. And Does that have to do with the fact up. that it's oil based or a heavier oil base? Well, we're not using enough oil for it to be a problem. Okay. And think, you know, from an oil perspective, it's more the fact that you know upregulate some of your, your cytochrome P four fifty systems. And Ooh, those actually, I don't even want to touch that because yeah. I have no idea what right, that right. is. So my last question it's is. About well, what advice, I mean, let's, we know people out there are going to be buying CBD. So what off, what advice can you offer to our listening audience? I guess do your due diligence and your homework and not just buying the first one that has a pretty flower on the label. Uh, that you really should look into the concentrations of, uh, you know, the, we'll say the major cannabinoids, making sure that it's, it's, it's uh, you know, below the 0.3% THC, so that you're not going to have any negative uh, repercussions due to, to THC and the psychotropic effects, but also looking at the uh, cannabinoid concentrations and making sure that it's enriched in, in uh, CBD at this point is what we're, we're most, I think, interested in, though the other cannabinoids do do have some, some biologic activity, too. So I think you really have to ask these folks uh, batch to batch what's the purity and consistency across the product. Um, you may want to ask them about uh, heavy metal testing. You may want to ask them about pesticide testing. Um, and try to understand uh, a little bit about the bang for your buck because, you know, some people will advertise that they have 250 milligrams while another one's going to advertise that it's got 50 milligrams per mil. Well, if I have 250 milligrams total in 60 mils, that's not a lot. If I have 50 milligrams per milliliter and I've got 60 mils, that's 3,000. So everybody's labeling their things differently, and so I think you have to be able to right. come to terms with what's, what's a good concentration. And I, I think anything above 30 mg per milliliter is probably something that you could probably tr- use in an eff- efficacious manner. But a lot of the other fly-by-night companies are you know, telling you they have you know, 300 milligrams in six yeah, 60 cc's, which isn't a lot. So, great. Well, great. for more information about this subject matter and to reach Dr. Joseph Washlog, visit vet.cornell.edu as well as lvetsciences.com. Oh, gnarly! <laughs> That's the bell signifying it's time to wrap the show. Before we go, we want to give you a preview for next week's show. Well, next week we're going to talk about understanding noses and scents, creating a pet-friendly room, and the need of service dogs for PTSD veterans. And before we go, Dr. Fleck, will you thank our guests? Special thanks to our guest, Assemblywoman Linda Rosenthal, Dr. Deborah Mandel, and Dr. Joseph Waxlag. And we must always thank our sponsors, the Animal Medical Center of Bradenton and EpiPet, making better skin, coat, and ear care products for healthier pets everywhere. Just so you know, you can follow along on our social media channels as the show airs. And if you have a question, write us at team at thepetbuzz.com. We'll cover it on our next show. And if you've missed any portion of this show, visit our social media channels and listen to the linked podcast on Monday morning. Most importantly, remember, we're here each week to help you take better care of your pets. Peace out and pet love. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Pet Buzz. The Pet Buzz is hosted by the dynamic pet duo, pet trendologist Charlotte Reed and Dr. Michael Fleck. Tune in each week for the latest 411 on everything pet related. Visit our website at www.thepetbuzz.com. Learn more about us, the show, and our guests. My name is Mike Ruiz, and I was born and raised in Montreal, Canada, and now I live in New Jersey. The thing that made me fall in love with Oliver was the very first time I met him, he was being fostered by a friend of mine whom I was visiting. I opened the door to my friend's house, and Oliver came running up to me, sat at my feet, and looked up at me with the most beautiful, big, brown, soulful eyes. And within 24 hours, I had filled out all the paperwork, and Oliver was my son. I've experienced a lot of discrimination with Oliver. We would walk down the street and people would literally cross the street. We you know when they would see us coming, you know, they saw like a menacing pit bull type dog. It just found it so baffling because Oliver was 
the sweetest, gentlest creature that I've ever met in my entire life. Sadly, I lost Oliver in August of 2018. I wanted to commemorate him in a way that was very meaningful. So I got this tattoo of him. It's just such an amazing thing. Knowing that I carry him in my heart, I now carry him on my arm. My name is Mike Ruiz, and Oliver and I are individuals.